We're here with Jim Irwin, uh, the boss at Cool City Avionics. Jim, there is there are those folks who take on challenges, and then there are those folks who take on real challenges. You are working specifically right now with development of autopilot and stabilization technologies for helicopters. And if that's just not totally insane, nothing else is. Well, first of all, as you know, I've been in the autopilot business for basically four decades, I guess. And uh, during that time, I've always been interested in helicopters. I flew helicopters in the military and instructed in helicopters. And, and I've always felt like autopilots, which was my main um, love and business, uh, are actually safety devices and could really do something to oh, enhance uh, helicopter safety. But they were, for the most part, not for small helicopters probably the ones that needed them the most. So we set about to design uh, sophisticated um, uh, systems for smaller helicopters that were affordable. So that's that's basically the charge. Tackling this part of the industry is very, very difficult. I, I think I've repeated three times today uh, something Frank Robinson and I shared a couple of years ago. He was telling me that the minute you go through any certification project with the word helicopter attached, the FAA has to hit you with a hammer three or four times before they'll even accept the application. Um, but at the same time, you, you bring up the safety issue. Helicopter flying is rigorous, it's demanding, and at times it's just downright difficult. So any way to enhance the, uh, of course, externally, the stability, control, and the capability of the aircraft through autopilot, through stability augmentation, that's a big deal. And let's face it, it's a tough nut to crack. How do you do it? Well, it turns out you do it very slowly. I, uh, <laughs> I, I started uh, certifying autopilots for airplanes a long, long time ago, and I was a flight test DER, and I managed departments that became a DAS. Uh, I've participated, and, and a lot of the people associated with me have participated in up to 3,500 STCs, and we felt, I think, with uh, uh, that we that we understood the system. But what Frank Robinson said about helicopters is probably true. Uh, it's a whole different area. Uh, it's very, very cautious, and it's uh, very slow moving. I don't think it was always slow moving, but it has been. Uh, in our experience in the last few years. You have to learn to work with the system that exists. And that's what we did with airplanes and we've gradually learned uh, to cope with and deal with the certification system that exists for helicopters. And um, it's working for us. We're, we're finally making a lot of progress. We've got uh, TSO, SAS system, and SDC on the R44. And we have a force trim system. These are small systems, but a force trim system that will be uh, hopefully STC approved next week. And uh, those two systems together will provide both stability and some hands off capability. It's relatively short term, but it's a great help. Uh, but we also have four. Uh, actual autopilot systems or flight control systems, both as plain autopilots and as autopilot with SCAS stability and control augmentation systems uh, embedded in them that should be approved um, in, uh, in May or, or early June. And that's a target I've missed a lot of times, not always due to our fault, but um, it's an arduous process. You said it, it's very, very complicated. But um, um, we've enjoyed uh, doing the product design, and we've actually enjoyed some parts of struggling through the certification, believe it or not. Can you give me a kind of an outline, if you would, of the difference between developing autopilot stability augmentation for fixed wing versus rotorcraft, and why you have to be a very special kind of person to want to take on those roles? Well, I don't know that the difference is quite uh, as, as dramatic as you suggest. Um, we tried years ago flying uh, low-cost airplane autopilots in helicopters, and basically they worked pretty good. In fact, the first one I demonstrated really? uh, was in 1974, I think. And uh, so the technology isn't required 
to be so so different. Um, helicopters are uh, require different control touch. Uh, they have a whole different vibration spectrum, and they have to be looked at quite differently from mm -hmm. the environmental point of view. And uh, and then are also the uh, a SAS or a SCAS system involves uh, getting involved inside the control system itself. Some of the actuators in a SAS are actually in between the pilot and the rotor head, which provides the pilot the advantage of realizing the stability improvements and augmentation that goes on, but it's totally transparent to the pilot. Everything, all the action going on behind him. In an airplane, those systems basically don't exist. The uh, airplanes are full uh, parallel, what we call parallel systems. They move the controls just like the pilot does. A, uh, an autopilot uh, in helicopters can also function that way, or it can use the SAS servos and then retrim the main control system position with something called a trim servo. Uh, our products are a little different in that we actually separate the functions of the of the actuators and servos. Okay. Our autopilot servos are autopilot servos, just like in an airplane. They're full authority servos, and they're the whole system's fail passive to several different levels, uh, way above 10 to the minus ninth. And, um, but the SAS system is a series system that's very low authority. That is, it, don't, it can't move the control system through its full range of control. It can only move it a small amount, mm -hmm. maybe a hundred thousandths of an inch. But because it can move it only a small amount, it can move it very fast. It can move it so fast and fast that, in fact, that sometimes uh, disturbances, most disturbances that are less than, say, 10% of the control authority, uh, just basically disappear as far as the pilot's concerned because the system with very sensitive onboard sensors detects the, the disturbance, turbulence, for instance, and the servos or the actuators act fast enough to remove it from the airplane's uh, motions okay. before the pilot even detects it. So those things are different and because of the speed of series actuators uh, they are scrutinized uh, because of the fact that they're inside the control tubes they're scrutinized. Lots of structural testing and so on that does not exist in airplanes. There are other, there are other elements uh, Jim mm -hmm. but those are the significant ones. Where do you see your primary market for the foreseeable future and where would you like to take this whole product line? Well, we've been rather aggressive, I guess, uh, overall, because we had a, a long range, a pretty uh, broad uh, plan. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been in the autopilot business for a long time. We looked at all segments. I also mentioned we learned that you could fly a helicopter with a basic uh, airplane system, so there's no I'm reason. You know, to be perfectly honest, I'm surprised you could get away with that. That's fascinating. Well, you can't notice we didn't certify that. We just went out to right. see if it would fly. Uh, the certification brings in uh, some more of the criticalities and makes it a little more difficult. But the point is, it can be done with the same piece of equipment. So what we did was design a three-axis autopilot with a two-axis SAS or SCAS in the case of the autopilot joint system that was uh, basically designed for helicopter use or airplane use. Now some of the subsystems are different. An airplane needs an elevator trim follow-up system. It doesn't need a SAS. Uh, an autopilot oh, can, very, can do without a SAS or SCAS, but it can use one very well. Mm -hmm. So the subsystems are different, but the basic system is the same. And we are flying airplanes with the product too. The airplane version is not certified yet, but will be. And the helicopter system, uh, it was actually designed so that we could price it low enough for small helicopters uh, and, uh, and thereby hopefully reap some of the safety advantages, but also is sophisticated enough to be certified for Part 29 and also larger helicopters. And of course, we are in fact doing a, an S61 uh, project Oh, for that has to be fun. IFR. Yeah, we flew the airplane the first time a couple of years ago, just briefly, and 
uh, it flew well. However, we didn't have all the peripheral couplers and so on associated yeah. with it. But later this year, that project is uh, will be completed. I think. Oh, I got to see that. So uh, when, when you get back into flight test on that, you got to give me a call. This okay. I got to see. Well, it's one of my favorite machines of all time. We, uh, yeah, it's a nice helicopter. And uh, uh, we've, years ago, we did some work with drones and very, very small airplanes. And I have come to appreciate the fact that the larger airplanes are usually easier to fly, and that's turned out that way, even Indeed. with even with helicopters. You've been an incredible influence in this industry. Can you, and I don't mean to embarrass you here, but can you tell these folks a little bit about your background? Because to a certain extent, boy, you are you are the autopilot industry. Well, I, I was lucky enough to start out of the Army working for uh, Mitchell Industries, and I'll make this very abbreviated, but Mitchell Industries was one of the first really low-cost autopilot companies mm -hmm. in general aviation that made autopilots uh, a necessary product in small airplanes. They used to be, a, before Mitchell, they were a novelty, and Mitchell did some that were novelties, but uh, I mean, that's the way they were classed. And, and emotionally, that's the way they were felt like, but uh, or felt about. But uh, Mitchell Industries evolved into Edo Air Mitchell, and uh, and then gradually, <coughs> uh, I moved away from Edo and started uh, with four partners, all equal partners, five of us, uh, STEC Corporation, and uh, we thought we had a better idea at the time. And uh, we were lucky enough to pull it off. Um, we were one of the first, maybe not the first, to introduce building block as a concept where you never had to throw anything away if you wanted to upgrade it. If you bought any one of our systems, you could upgrade it to anything else. And that worked for us. Um, it was not a big element of the business, but it created tremendous loyalty in the customers. We had customers. We also uh, upgraded autopilots to uh, later model airplanes or different model airplanes if the owner uh, traded his airplane in. Usually by then the autopilot wasn't worth much, but he liked it. He wanted to take it with him. We made kits to adapt the thing to whatever he bought. We had people that transferred the same autopilot to five different airplanes. Those kind of things help ordinary people that own airplanes. And we've carried all that forward into the helicopter uh, business now, too. The systems are all building block the same way. And STEC, by the way, went on, uh, started a recession, just like we started this when I, I promise never to do that again, by the way, <laughs> if I can survive this startup. But uh, uh, we ended up with uh, a good bunch of dealers, and they're the backbone, really, of, of this kind of an operation. And uh, they sold a lot of autopilots and all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, sold have, several to me. We have some of them on board with us again now. Plus, uh, a lot of the founders and not necessarily founders, although one or two of them are working with us. But a lot of STEC folks are working with us. And uh, so that's uh, that's basically the background. This one is a little different. We never did a helicopter system before. But as I said earlier, we're planning to do airplanes and helicopters, and they do fit together well. So what's the future hold at this point for Cool City? You're, you're on the cusp of some certifications that, well, we all know how difficult it is right now with the FAA's budgets and the restriction on manpower and things of that nature to get anything done. Yeah. So you are held hostage to the bureaucracy. So with luck, you'll get what you need to get when you need to get it. But if you can plot something of an outline or a roadmap for the foreseeable future, what does Cool City look like for the next year or two or three? Well, for the next year, because of how long it takes to, to obtain SDCs, we're gonna concentrate on the helicopter industry and products, broadly across the board. Our attitude at STEC was to fly anything. Mm -hmm. And those that are familiar with STEC and even Mitchell Industries, I ran the certification department there for 12 years, and our attitude was to 
uh, do STC anything we could make a buck on. It didn't matter if it was an antique airplane or what it was. Right. We'll be doing the same sort of thing in the helicopter business at, at Cool City. And uh, however, as I mentioned, we've already expanded into the airplane market, so that one uh, will take place probably at the beginning of next year. Oh my. We have uh, new products for helicopters that will be a, a, a low-cost four-axis uh, system upgrade that will also be retrofittable that we're working on uh, for That's the existing project. system. That's a, a, a significant technical upgrade in a product like ours, but it will also, as I say, be retrofittable. And um, in the S61 I mentioned, there's some other projects that's, that come off of that. And in fact, we're uh, involved with a uh, very futuristic uh, potential um, for a, a, a military contract, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, down the road someplace uh, as a, a component of a much larger operation. So, uh, and it also brings advances to, to the, to the autopilot industry, if you would. So we've got a lot of vision in front of us. Uh, we're tickled to death to be here. We love the helicopter business, but we also uh, love uh, GA airplanes. I see a bunch of them running around now. I haven't had the pleasure of flying, and while I'm still upright, I'd still like to do that. There you go. Uh, so we love them both. And, uh, 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 and we've looked down the road, we like what we see. It's been tough the last four or five years for everybody. Uh, we joined this operation right at the beginning of a recession again. And, uh, uh, and now we got some government cutbacks and things, but I think if, and I'm speaking to everybody, if we tough it out together, we'll make it together. Yeah, but the one thing the last two, few years have proven is that the innovators are the, are the true leaders. This, these are the folks who not only survive, but will survive long enough to have huge effects on the industry for years to come. I agree with that. I, uh, when we started STEC, uh, just briefly, we decided uh, in 78 when we started, there were a lot of Cessna 210Ps crashing in IFR because they lost the vacuum pump and lost the instruments and the pilots weren't up to fly in the airplane and so on. So we wanted to create an autopilot that had no dependence on the gyros at all. We used an accelerometer and pitch and a rate gyro and roll. Uh, later there was another system created within the industry about 10 years later that emulated those properties. This system, the, the current line of Cool City, uh, brings that to a different level. We started out by developing a gyro package for the autopilot before we had the autopilot. And that uh, gyro package is a MIM sensor package that's embedded in the system as standard equipment, and it provides uh, roll and pitch derived attitude, similar to an AHAR, it's not quite as good, but plenty good for an autopilot. But it's largely a backup system, but it's fully capable of doing ILSs and GPS LPV approaches and everything else without any reference outside the autopilot. We believe those are little safety elements that innovation can bring, or stubbornness, I'm not sure which it is, Jim. Final question, sir. Are you having any fun? I haven't been having much fun in the last four or five years. I spent almost all my time trying to raise money. But I can see the light at the end of the tunnel, Jim, and I expect to have a lot of fun. As long as the light at the end of the tunnel doesn't have a train whistle attached. No, I've got uh, <laughs> spies out checking on that, and they tell me it's just a light. There you go. Sir, you have my respect always. I know what you've done, and uh, I've, I've found many a product that I know you had your hands in over the years and own quite a few. Uh, I don't know how many s tanks I own, but it was quite a few through a number of airplanes. Well, I appreciate you. your time, and I can't wait to see what you're doing down the line. And more important, I'm really looking forward to flying uh, your future gear. Thank we'll you, sir. We'll call you. Oh. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> you call, I come running. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Aero TV's live coverage of the 56th annual AEA International Convention and Trade Show is brought to you in part by the following sponsors. 